plenty of time for that during the week. Um, our net, we're starting back our next session, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Rosemary Kay from the University of New South Wales in Australia. And Rosemary is going to talk to us about states' obligations to protect human rights and promote development. Drafted. 
And I think the reason that the CRPG is one of the most complex human rights treaties that have been drafted is because it's the baby treaty. It's the treaty that has been negotiated with the experience of the implementation of the other treaties. So the human rights framework, the human rights jurisprudence, and the experience of that process has come to bear in the drafting of CRPT. And it has been developed in a way that is much more complex than the other instruments. If we look at the history of human rights treaties, and we look at the first, the initial human rights treaties, the treaty following UDHR, I'll just move to these columns that are coming in. This is not audience shaving in any ways. <laughs> If we look at the original instrument that followed UDHR, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, if you look at a non-discrimination treaty in its most basic form. It's a treaty that develops the definition of racial discrimination and then applies that definition of racial discrimination to all human rights and fundamental freedoms. There are six substantive articles to the ICERD. So ICERD is what we will see as a classic human rights treaty. CRPD is a hybrid treaty. It is a hybrid treaty in that it contains both first and second generation rights. So first generation rights being rights of non-intervention, civil and political rights, and second generation rights, which are economic, social and cultural rights. And they are seen as rights of progressive realisation. Whilst I don't adhere to that clear delineation of those two classes of rights, that is how they have been understood and that is how they have been written about. The complexity of CRPD doesn't end there. And far be it from me to argue with the Special Rapporteur. I don't agree with her position that there are new rights within CRPD. But I do agree that there are new concepts within CRPD that increases its complexity but also improves its thoroughness in terms of implementation. And that's what I want to look at this morning. So it's a comprehensive coverage and, and it has numerous obligations. Many of the core concepts are new and not reflected in domestic law. It addresses the diversity of disability. And when we talk about the diversity of disability, or we could talk about the diversity of ability, we're talking about recognising disability as just one aspect of the human condition. And this is where I come back to the point that I don't agree with Qatar. I generally agree with Qatar on most things, but I don't agree with Qatar that there are no new rights within the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That there, uh, there are new rights. <laughs> I don't believe there are any new rights in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but I believe this for a very specific reason. Whilst technically it is possible as a legal theoretician to sit down and argue out within international law and its jurisprudence <coughs> that they are direct tra translations of existing human rights and fundamental freedoms. You can do that, and as I just said to a colleague a few minutes ago in the coffee break, 
That's what international lawyers need to do. Torture rights to make them fit their argument. <laughs> I want to torture these rights for one very basic argument. That once we start saying CRPD creates new rights, we start to try, we start to move away from the argument that disability is just one aspect of the human condition. If we're in agreement that CRPD is just a reformulation of existing human rights and fundamental freedoms, we are in agreement that disability is part of the human family. And then diversity and recognition of disability as part of the human family means that those rights contained within the International Bill of Human Rights, and when I speak of the International Bill of Human Rights, so I mean the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the two accompanying covenants, the covenant on civil and political rights and the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights. We are agreeing that people with disability were always seen as part of the human family and protected by that instrument, and that CRPT is just an expression of those rights within a disability context. intersectionality across numerous fronts. CRPD has presented international law an experience of intersectionality that hadn't been addressed at the international level prior. I said and CEDAW failed to pick up many intersectional issues. But CRPD has been able to pick up intersectionality both across personal characteristics, but also across substantive rights. And we'll talk about this as we go through. And it engages numerous actors so it recognises not just the role of government, but it recognises for the first time in international law the role of civil society, and in particular, disabled persons organisations. Now, whilst civil society, and to that extent, disabled persons organisations have had an formal role within the international law and the work of the United Nations, it has never had an implicit binding role within any of the previous instruments. That has been included within CRPD and it is one of the new concepts. It also anticipates the transversal application across the T treaty. You can tell an American wrote this transversal. Are <laughs> <laughs> uh, US colleagues in the room? <laughs> All right, just be quiet up there. <laughs> and and being here in sense somewhere that probably shouldn't be here, but we'll argue about that later. Um, so when we're talking about the transversal application, we're talking about very new concepts and some old concepts that have been mixed together in this treaty. So Articles 1 to 9, um, for the lawyers in the room, create... See? They're bored with me already. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Okay. Transversal application. So, Articles 
one to nine. So, set up. Part of the interpretive mm -hmm. matrix. One to nine in the preamble. When we talk about the interpretive matrix. Are you sure this is? No, I've got it off, yeah. I'm off, yes, of course that's. Spatulous words. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Good to go. She's a worn through one mic, and I'm not even, you know. American manufacturer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> They're picking me up from Pine Gap. None of you people know where Pine Gap is, do you? Last year, so you're the only Australian in the room, are you? Oh no, there's more Australians. Good. <laughs> okay, try again. We're back to transversal application. So, transversal application, um, the interpretive matrix. So the interpretive matrix sets up the way you interpret all of the articles. So these articles cut across all of the substantive articles. They help the formation of both 10 to 30, which are the operative substantive articles, that tease out the core fundamental rights, and also the measures, implementation and facilitation measures. But they also feed into um, the administrative articles. So articles 31 to 33. And so the implementation and monitoring. Can we go to the next slide, please? So how does CFDD frame disability inclusion in development? Um, you know when you're writing something and you say emphasis added, that emphasis was added, it's not mine. But she makes a very valid point. Most people, and including the drafters, which, okay, Kat and I have got to put our hands up, uh, I think about the only two people in the room that sat through five years of um, negotiations, but I'm sure she'll agree with me that everyone obsessed about Article 32 and um, international cooperation, but didn't spend a lot of time talking about how the other articles would talk to it. We talked about it behind the scenes, but it was, all, it was very hard to get a discussion happening on the floor. And Catherine and I will hopefully be able to talk about those things a bit later today. But it is definitely much more than Article 32. The legal basis for disability inclusion is scattered throughout CRPD. It relates back to that interpretive matrix that I was just talking to you about, that frames and informs and interprets what donor countries should be doing when they're negotiating development programs and also when they're developing development policies. I'm going to trip myself up on developing development, aren't I? Mm -hmm. All money reporting. Okay. Um, <coughs> it also identifies provisions of CRPD or areas in domestic law to help frame a development project. So CRPD gives us what Katya was saying this morning, a very informative tool that gives us some of the core issues in disability and identifies areas that should, could need work. And so it gives you a framework of understanding disability rights. And you can also use CRPD to identify likely barriers legal, institutional, environmental, cultural, to disability inclusion in development projects. So how does a disability inclusion project speak to the issues raised in CRPD? Or how does CRPD, used as a framework to analyse the 
Development Program project identify barriers that are that have been included. And it gives a frame of reference to consider possible entry points for disability inclusion. So what is the project working on? And where might disability be an entry point. So how do you analyse this project in terms of the way that it addresses the substantive elements of CRPD? It also gets you to ask specific questions and look at aspects of the development project that are essential for, develop, uh, for ensuring disability inclusion. So what should be in there? What sh has to be included to ensure inclusion? And it also sets forward a framework of strategies, specific strategies for inclusion. So the obligation set up a framework that suggests you should have disability expertise in project design or monitoring by DPOs or for budgeting for universal design. So what it does is it gives you a tool to be able to analyse and to be able to measure a project against to see if it will adequately be disability inclusive. <coughs> we can just learn this. Okay, so let's go over the CRPD in a little bit more detail. Don't panic, okay, I'm not getting too late here. First of all, there's the preamble. The preamble sets up the intellectual, uh, sorry, the preamble sets up the intellectual antecedents to the convention. I know it looks like a whole list of adverbs, but it is more just than a list of adverbs. Believe me, it is more than a list of adverbs. The preamble in CRPD for those train spotters like myself, us international lawyers don't get out very often, but when we do, we generally talk about international law, so you have to forgive us. <laughs> but if you pay close attention to the intellectual antecedents of the CRPD, there are some very interesting, explicit instruments that have been left out. So the CRPD preamble speaks to a lot of the core instruments and a lot of the soft law instruments such as the standard rules on the equalisation of opportunities for persons with disabilities. It speaks to the World Programme of Action. What it doesn't mention are the two earliest, earliest declarations, the 1971 and 1975 declarations, and it doesn't mention the 1991 um, mental health mental illness, mental illness principles. They are specific exclusions. So what CRPD has done is isolated from the interpretive matrix those three existing instruments. Recognised for the paternalistic nature of those instruments and identifying that this was an area that we needed to move away from in implementation of human rights when it came to the community and diversity and ability. And so the preamble is actually quite an important part if you're to understand the full interpretation of the convention. Most people like to look at it as a list of adverbs, but it is more than a list of adverbs. 
And I'm also really, really impressed the way they think up a different adverb for each one. I will be able to do it. So then we move on to the articles of general application. So the articles of general application are like so one to nine. People will argue to live rule in the face with me about whether nine is a general application or a substantive article. I think it's one of general application, but we won't start that debate here. And Janet's not here for me to fight with, so I get to win this time. <laughs> so one to nine. One to nine do some very important things. One that does a critically important thing in combination with the preamble. Once again, the preamble is more than just adverbs. The preamble and one create what is a de facto definition of disability. Now, if I could, I press the buttons and write up there in big, bold, black letters and go emphasis added. CRPD does not contain a definition of disability. I've come from the Conference of States Parties in New York and just about had a foot and fell off my perch when someone up on the podium started talking about the definition of disability in CRPT. It does not have a definition of disability. There is no Biden definition in that treaty. Got a picture? <laughs> right. What it does do is it scopes out the state's parties the breadth of the class of protected persons. So using non-binding elements and some binding elements it crafts an understanding of disability or ability, depending on how you want to frame your language. So it talks about disability as an, an evolving concept. So it's not pinned down to certain things or certain people with certain characteristics. It's an evolving understanding of ability within the human character. And then it says that that can manifest in these different ways. That it can include, but it is not exhaustive of. And it sets out a relationship to aspects of the human being. So it could be about vision, it could be long term, it could be short term. Sorry, it could be long term, it could be. Um, mental, it could be physical, it could be sensory, it could be intellectual. It's not definitive, it is a broad scope. But what it says is that the protection must be for all persons with disability. And so there is an obligation on states not to define out certain classes of people and certain types of ability or lack of ability. The other two through to nine are cross cutting <coughs> articles. So two are the definitions which just gives greater understanding to elements such as reasonable accommodation, communication. Three is an incredibly important article. Three gives you, gives depth to the interpretive matrix. I don't agree with all the general principles. I think some of the general principles shouldn't be there. I myself would put some different general principles in there. I'm just an over-opinionated academic and I've always got a different version of how something could be done. <laughs> You've probably all got your own versions, but they're not a bad list. And they are a way of cross-referencing each and every article and how they should be implemented. 
So do they speak to the equality between, between men and women? Do they recognise the evolving capacities of children? Does it speak to... Um, does it speak to people being able to make their own autonomous decisions? Does it speak to equality of opportunity? Does it speak to accessibility? Does it speak to non-discrimination? And so that gives you an implementation reference where you can go back and look at each article and any intended implementation of an article and cross-reference against those eight general principles. Four, we will go through in a lot of detail in the next few minutes. Five is, okay, the whole raison d'etre of the, um, sorry, I, I did not say that as an Australian, I will now say that as an Australian, the raison d'etre of the um, whole treaty, and that is the articulation of disability. Um, equality and non-discrimination. Six and seven are new concepts and this is where you talk about the true complexity of CRPD coming to the fore. It is where CRPD picked up intersectionality and addressed it. Six is women and seven is children. It identifies the double discrimination, multiple forms of discrimination that people can experience. The draft has tried hard to get more recognition of intersectionality across population groups, indigeneity being one of the ones that, well, I know the Australian delegation fought very hard for. And um, there were many other delegations that tried to get a broader range of um, specific population groups recognised to increase the understanding of intersectionality and ability. But at least we made really strong inroads in terms of women and children. And the good thing about this is it's not just contained within these two substantive articles. What they are are the precursor and they are the vertical element that clearly identifies that women and children could be doubly disadvantaged. But it also creates the basis for the horizontal and so the mainstreaming of gender and age, so a gender perspective and an age perspective throughout the substantive articles. And you will see in different articles clear reference to a gender perspective and to an age perspective. We then, um, accessibility, accessibility, uh, sorry, awareness raising and accessibility. Awareness raising is eight and accessibility is nine. Two critical, um, two critical articles. They need to be remembered in terms of any implementation of any article. They are absolutely critical because many of, many of the barriers um, for people with disability are driven by stereotypes. <laughs> and stereotypes can be really pro quite problematic if not addressed from the very beginning. They feed assumptions and People with disability have lived in a world made on assumptions about disability and how we should live. Article 9 gets to the guts of what CRPD is about. It's about building accessible communities. This tries to put a framework around accessibility and the understanding of accessibility. And it's an incredibly important cross-cutting article. Then we look at the uh, specific standards, so the rights and obligations, Articles 10 to 30. Some of these are direct translations, such as the, well, number 10, right to life. 
right through to um, Article 19, which is a bit of a torturing of um, freedom of birthday, but you know, we're creative. And uh, that's Article 19, living independently and being part of the community. And then there's the implementation and facilitation measures, Articles 31 to 40. And the final provisions, um, which, oh, you know, unless you're really working in the Department of Justice or Office of International Law or something, you yeah, know, it's all that really sort of mundane stuff about, you know, how you ratify and all that sort of stuff. So, and where the depository is in New York, really exciting. But us lawyers get excited about it. Thank you. Okay, CRPD obligations are integral part, are integral part of human rights law. Yeah, that's sort of bold obvious really. Uh, it was, was developed by the United Nations. Um, it was adopted by the General Assembly and it gets ratified by a whole bunch of countries. So yes, it is part of international human rights law and I'm only going to get away with that because Janet's got to be the tough one. But yes, CRPD is part of the international law of human rights. Taxi. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to invite the Australians back again, are you? <laughs> but what CRPD as part of international human rights law is that it elaborates dis um, human rights in the context of disability. It also, um, I mean, it's about recognising the human, right, human rights are indivisible, indivisible and interdependent. So all must be implemented, promoted and protected. So there is no hierarchy, but there is an interrelationship with all rights. And there will be, I think, forever and a day, debates about immediate realisation and progressive realisation. But we will, we will talk about that. But I suppose what I wanted to say was there will always be an argument about progressive realisation and immediate realisation. But that doesn't mean that the, the, the rights shouldn't be implemented. Progressive realisation should not be understood as a delaying tactic. Progressive realisation is about making a very, very conscious, crafted, targeted decision about how to implement. Not whether to implement, but how to implement. The CRPD must be interpreted in good faith, taking into account its objects and purpose, ordinary meanings of terms, preparatory work and relevant practice. Again, for us lawyer trained spotters, that's straight from, well, not straight from, but, you know, it's taken from the Vienna Convention on the Laws of Treaties. Yes, they all got together in Vienna and chatted about well, how do we interpret a treaty? <laughs> so, and this is what they came up with. No, that's just Article 31. Article 31 of the Vienna Laws, um, laws of Treaties um, sets out how treaties must be interpreted. And so what that gives you is the principles and objectives, so, sorry, the objects and purpose, so what is the object? What is the purpose of the, the convention? Should be the overarching guiding thought process. The ordinary meaning of the terms. So basically, what do the articles say? And then, how does the work, preparatory work and relevant practice, how has that informed us? So what is the jurisprudence of the treaty body had to say? 
So when we talk about the jurisprudence, we talk about the jury jurisprudence for individual com I was going to say complaints, communications, and also the jurisprudence in terms of uh, excuse me. Um, concluding, sorry, general comments and concluding observations. So what's come out of the periodic reviews and what has come out of the policy work of the treaty body? Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, as I said before, I didn't prepare for these slides. <laughs> There's lots of meaning behind that picture. We can talk about the international symbol for disability above the toilet door. We could talk about the word insight inside. But frankly, I think we'll just go to the next slide. <laughs> of CRPD obligations. I told you we'd get back to progressive realisation. Um, so, economic, social and cultural rights to be attained progressively, but some are immediately realisable. See, I told you, you Americans, there'd be a Z for you. There'll be several Zs, I'm sure of it. Um, such as non-discrimination. This is where it gets a little bit tricky because so many of the articles, whether they be civil and political um, rights or economic, social and cultural rights, can contain an element of non-discrimination. And so, debate gets a little bit tricky, gets a little bit lawyerish. We love it. And we'll try and tease it apart a bit over the next couple of days. States parties, developing and developed alike, are accountable both to the international community and to their own people for the compliance with the obligations of the CRPD. So when a country ratifies CRPD, it is entering into an agreement with the community of nations. You know the way we all like to talk about the UN as if the UN was something separate and different. Now, my own particular country is at, at the moment has a government that doesn't have great love for the UN and they talk about the UN as if the UN was some separate creature that was um, treating them appallingly for treating other people appallingly. Um, <laughs> gee, I don't know why they're shocked really. <laughs> to go figure. Um, but they forget that the UN is the community of nations of which they are one of. And that when you ratify, rat ratify. <laughs> us Australians, we're so eloquent. Um, when you ratify a convention, you are making an agreement with your peers as a one member of the community of nations to the others. And so what that does is that binds you in that arrangement and to meet those obligations under CRPD. The nature and scope of CRPD obligations, Janet's got to hear space experts pay special attention to the principles laid out in Article 3. And it comes, there's, you know, the nature and scope can be crafted from those eight general principles that are set out in Article 3. And also through the cross-cutting obligations in Articles 3 to 9. So we're looking at states' parties' obligations and also their compliance with CRPT. It is that interpretive framework that can give the most insight. 
prioritising of measures to improve the standard of living for people in poverty and other disadvantaged groups, taking into account that specific measures may be required to protect cultural rights of Indigenous peoples and minorities. So, when you prioritise, when well, there may be a need for governments to prioritise the living standard of certain groups, um, specific measures may need to be taken to address to address certain disadvantaged groups within the community, but also there may need to be other measures taken to protect certain classes within a class within the community. So whilst you might be taking a specific measure to address issues for people from an Indigenous community, it might need a more specific reference to deal with issues for women from the Indigenous community. And this is very true for our own Indigenous community when we talk to disability, issues of disability, with such a high prevalence rate our Indigenous population experiences disability at around 37% of the population compared to 20, 18 to 20% of our general population. So, Article 3. And this is where I'd like some engagement with you guys. So, Article 3, informing development, design, planning and implementation. So what Article 3 principles are most at stake in? So I'm assuming that um, participants have access to the convention. Yeah, we don't have any facts though. Oh, it's not in the facts. Oh, see? <laughs> see what happens when you assume? <laughs> <laughs> make an ass out of you and me. And I've just made an ass out of myself. No, I, they don't have access to Article 3. Someone, can someone confirm that in their packs? Do you have it? No, no. Not in the pack? Okay. It was sent to the Dropbox. Okay, uh, well, it's in the Dropbox. So if, if people have enough computers or devices to share, look at Article 3. Article 3. Uh, yeah.
I mean, uh, um, capacity for children with disabilities and the respect of the right of children with disabilities to preserve their identities, like for example, but yeah. how to exactly apply it is something we could Yeah, think. so what, what might you be looking for in that? teachers have got some um, understanding about how ability can vary with um, children and not just in terms of other areas but also physical, cognitive, mental development of um, children and for them to recognise that they will also <coughs> develop biologically as well as differently in terms of ability, but that their chronological age should be recognised as evolving as other children and age chronologically as well. So 10 year olds should be doing things that 10 year olds do, regardless of ability. Three year olds should be doing what three year olds do regardless of ability. Okay, so rule of law projects such as juvenile just, oh, justice law reform. Yeah, Andrew. So it's about, about accessibility, so something around communication. We need to make sure that um, people's different communication needs are met and that people can communicate whatever way is most appropriate with them. Yeah, excellent point that, you know, recognising alternative scripts for vintage in speech, um, sign interpretation, sign language. What else might come into play here? Yes. Just in front of you. Um, what about infrastructure, creating a free working environment for children with disability to be able to access their classrooms or school environment? Yeah, that would work for both one and two, that it's got an accessible environment and also that the judicial, um, the judicial environment is also accessible. What about disaster response? Um, I would say maybe that early warning systems are accessible to everybody. That um, maybe that humanitarian aid is universally accessible. That people are given access to replacement assistive devices, if needs be, and that in building that better, you have universal design that can perform that. Okay, so what? Which of the principles, general principles, would you align that back to? I don't have those in front of me. Sorry. Has anyone got the list that they could <laughs> give her a quick squeeze at? Anyone else want to jump in and suggest what they think it might speak to? Accessibility. Sorry? Accessibility. Accessibility, yep.
sat on Bruce Briquet's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Emergency <laughs> situation. <laughs> I'll be back. It's all right, I won't take it personally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, non-discrimination. Yeah, um, and non-discrimination to me, well obviously, as the first person said, all of the principal, principles apply to all of them. But it's perfectly possible, let's say, in teacher training, to create awareness of the evolving capacities of children, but that doesn't necessarily lead to any greater outcome. It often that awareness leads to more sense of difference. So without non-discrimination, any of these things could either maintain the situation as it is, or make the situation worse. Um, and so there's a certain principle of do no harm in, in development, um, that creating awareness in and of itself may not be very useful, and that that's particularly true, I think, in police training. Um, so, for me, with many of these things, it's the non, the, it, perhaps first among equals is non-discrimination. Okay. So that it speaks to true equality. Up the back. Um, in, in America right now, we're having a lot of police brutality issues with the whole non-discrimination as well, but also in terms of like equality um, between men and women, it's um, really hard for women to go into this police training field in general because of the police brutality that's happening. So exactly, the non-discrimination just kind of like applies both the equality of race and um, between gender as well. Yeah, I mean non-discrimination. Um it's a shame Janet's not here. Um, she's from Baltimore and has been experiencing some of the sad, sad situations that have been occurring in the US most recently. But um, equality between men and women um, is a critical point, and it's a critical point not just in recognising that um, there should be non-discrimination between the sexes, but to also recognise that there could be specific work that needs to be done to recognise um, the rights of women within um, certain programs. So just giving formal equality to men and women doesn't always get you to where you want to be, where you have to be. And that a lot of the times it could be approaching it from a completely different way. Um, I have absolutely no idea what the next point is about. <laughs> Good. Can you explain it to me? Because they assumed they had 
something wrong with them. <laughs> Which is, I mean, for anyone who has disability, we, we encounter this all the time. But the idea is that there was no other possibility. So there's been a lot of work done, and I felt like I'm defending the UN here a little bit, to try and improve the peacekeeping manuals to have some work done to ensure that they can make their DER programme inclusive. So, for example, the training programmes would, would be accessible to people with disabilities, whether that's hearing and text or whatever. So, I know that that's, I guess, added to this, so it could speak across the world about this non discrimination and inclusion. Um, but I think it's also important to highlight that it's the whole issue around legality and um, international humanitarian law and human rights law is an area that I'm not an expert in. But I know there are some issues around the um, treatment of um, ex combatants, particularly ex combatants with disabilities, which I don't know whether that's also what this was getting at, but there is now in the legal system, in the international legal, legal system, some debate around the treatment of prisoners with disabilities. But I don't know if I've answered the question, but at least I know what it's been DDR, but it means. <laughs> <laughs> well, thinking this, I didn't have a clue what DDR was talking about. Funnily enough, I didn't know what ex combatants were, but I didn't know how the two went together, so. Um, I told you it was good that we had a good brains trust in the room because I would be lucky. Um, so, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your name, but I, and I, I should have, it would be sloppy. Um, thank you for that, and I think you're quite right that there's a possibility that, you know, all of them are important, and for every, every point, every single one of the principles is going to have. Um, is, is going to be relevant to some, some more than others, but all should be considered. So, improving water sanitation. Uh, hang on a sec. Does anybody want to um, make a suggestion in terms of DDR and ex combatants? Yes. Down the front here. Now we're going time. If you've got 15 minutes. Um, yes, okay. that's a very important area. Um, for my undergraduate degree, I wrote on the impact of the reparation program towards what it takes in Sierra Leone. And what we discovered in my research is that most times um, people who become mostly affected, the war victims, about 80 to 90 percent of them are people with disabilities. Like you have in Sierra Leone, the amputees, the war women, sexually abused. But um, what we found out was that the disarmament, the people, the ex-combatants were better integrated, better um, given attention than the war victims. If you look at um, the money spent on the ex-warlord Charles Stilo, it is triple times what is spent to look after the war victims in Sierra Leone. And what happened, most of them were just current time in war camps and left the, um, they were abandoned. So most of them are engaged in street begging. So actually, what international bodies need to do, there should be better attention given to war victims, who are most times people with disability, rather than focusing on better attention to the perpetrators. I think it's a major problem of concern. Yeah, it sounds like a sounds like a, a bit of a um, a dilemma that um, one group yeah. is getting greater focus than the other. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to see what principles if you turn that around to say uh, it was not just about the, um, the DDR program, but looking at something for war victims, mm -hmm. what principles you would pick up. And again, you know, I would say all eight of them would um, come into play. Come into play. What about improving water and sanitation infrastructure? Sore subject here. Beg your pardon? Sore subject here. Oh. Yeah. Hi, 
term very differently in Australia, but does anybody want to have a crack? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Vandalan Vandal from Zambia. Um, I would say the, the I, I see two principles here. Um, the principle of non discrimination which has broad, um, broad application. But um, in, in terms of context, I would say uh, full and effective participation and inclusion in society. I say so because of um, the repatriation programs that have been carried out by the UNHCR. Um, 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 one, one, of the, one of the issues that has been raised is how do uh, our refugees who are victims for example, mines and, and, mines, and land mines and so on, how are they included in the repatriation program? So you, you, you have a bus that is coming in, but then um, um, and that bus does not take into account the, 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 the practical aspects of, of, of repatriation. And, and then you, you have a situation where people are taken back home, but then there is no uh, kind of reasonable accommodation um, that is provided during the transportation and, and during the resettlement and, and, and then the resettlement action plan also does not take into account um, the sons with disability so it doesn't um, it, it doesn't reasonably accommodate them so I would say that um, the issue of full and effective participation and inclusion in society permeates throughout the repatriation process of, of, of refugees so I think this is um, on point so is the re resettlement process not um, not discriminatory? So is it accessible to people, or is all the information on accessible in alternative formats? Um, are people av available to engage in the process in the mode and method of communication? 
communication that is there, is, is of their first language. Um, and also, once they're resettled, <laughs> do they have access to the community on an equal basis with others? Um, are they able to free, to fully participate within the society that once they're resettled back? Um, reforming national disability legislation. Please. Certainly. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm Papa Jane from Senegal. That's nice you. I speak French, but I will try to let you know my point of view on this point. Oh, that's okay. I've heard your English as well. <laughs> <laughs> talking, talking uh, at the academic level, the national reception of international law here. At the beginning, you said that uh, CFPD doesn't contain binding definition of disability. So, by the implementation of the convention, you have flexibility, national flexibility. So, sorry, what was that last one? National flexibility. Oh, flexibility. Yeah. Yes, countries has now the room to implement the the provision of the Constitution, of the Convention, to give sense to disability and make it binding. <laughs> so they have right now the opportunity to, to, to go beyond the provision of the Convention and make it more binding and give disability more forces to implement the, the provision of the Convention the system of reception. So states can be can give more binding forces to the provision at this level. They could. Um, I mean essentially they they could. I, I believe it would be difficult considering the provision includes all persons with disability. But um, yeah the potential is there you are yeah. And, and at this level, and at this level too, we can see if the country itself is how can I say in English? It, is really involved, is really involved in the process. Yeah. And give importance to the process. That's what and what principle do you think that speaks to? I mean, what's the first first general principle? So I'd like to read out the first general principle for me. Um, and if 
I can, I just wanted to ask you something about the refugees because um, I can see now in my city that is in, is in Milano there are lots of, um, of refugees because it's like they, they come to Sicily and then Milano is the point where they are like divided into different countries. But then uh, some other countries decided to block the barriers, so the, I don't know how to say in English, the, yeah, the borders. And, and, we, and we have a, um, um, some difficulties to understand how to do because, and this, because there are a large amount of um, people in uh, structures that are not big enough. And I think that this can have like a, a big impact on disabilities because um, when I, 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 I attended other some schools about human rights and disabilities, also in my country. And what, what I don't hear so much sometimes is that human rights and the realization of rights has got a cost that is economical. Because, for example, in this case, it's for uh, sanitary services, medical services, and so on. And, um, and this, in this case, of refugees means like a cooperation that has to be from regions. For example, there are in Italy some regions that doesn't want to cooperate. So, for example, mine is completely alone in the north of Italy. And then a cooperation that is also international. So, I think that in this point, also about disability, um, on the topic of refugees, there is a lack of cooperation between states. Um, uh, could you more in terms of refugees? In terms of refugees, there is a, a, a lack of cooperation across the board. Um, Italy is not alone in that, and I, as an Australian, have absolutely no right to preach to anybody about treatment of refugees. Um, oh, God, I hate wearing that bitch. Yes. Uh, hello, I, uh, my name is Malena Duda. I am from Romania. I'm the ex director of, uh, of an NGO focused on the rights of children with disabilities. Uh, I'd like to emphasize a little bit um, the, the aspect of reforming national disability legislation. Because this is one of, uh, one of our major concerns, at least in Europe, and as far as I heard, as well in Italy, there are problems. Of course, you asked us about which of the principles, principles should be applied? Yes, all of them, all of them. But yes. not, not this is uh, not this is a problem because uh, what we face right now in Romania and it's not a, a, just a local thing is that all the entire legislation uh, basically states at the very beginning some of these principles or uh, all of them maybe, but we have this gap between the principles and the, um, their op uh, right. operationalization. Exactly. Uh, there are no um, um, factual things or articulated ideas how to implement uh, accessibility, how to respect the evolving um, potential of the children of this, with disabilities, and so you end up in having pieces of legislation uh, which have uh, which have like very good general principles, but you uh, you go down to the law and you have the segregation um, norms um, in education, for instance, and you have a, a lot of other measures that are discriminatory. So I think it will be uh, very very important that UN and other relevant actors at the international level and also um, the, the academics to find some um, lines how to implement these uh, principles. Of course, non-discrimination is easier because it's an older uh, 
principle will be also in other other respects. But when it comes to to accessibility and when it comes to uh, to evolving potential of children with disabilities and full and effective participation, is where we have a huge problem. And this is what the CRPG principles, the general principles, are supposed to be used as. <coughs> They're not supposed to be used as a list of principles that should be stuck at the front of a policy or the front of a piece of legislation. They are there for you to ask questions about. So when you're looking at HIV and AIDS prevention, how does it, how does it address the quality between men and men and women? What does it do to increase the access of information and the program for women? How does it um, recognise the evolving capacities of children with disability? Does it, does it have the information available to high school children, recognising their sexual um, evolution as well as their, um, with, along with their chronological age with their peers? How does it... Um, how does the program roll out in terms of non-discrimination? Is all the information accessible in alternative formats? Is there a mechanism for people to complain and to claim their rights if it is, if they are violated? Um, and in the interest of time, I really would like to move on because I just want to speak briefly to the General Article 4, General Obligations, which is one of the big drivers within the CRPT for um, inclusive international development. So, Article 4, General Obligations, these are the overarching obligations that a state takes on when it ratifies um, CRPT. So it has a dynamic relationship with all the other provisions in, of the Convention. And it describes the nature of the general legal obligations undertaken by states parties to CRPD. So it broadly scopes out what the obligations of the state are. And these general obligations and the other cross-cutting obligations in the introductory provisions must be applied across the whole of the substantive articles. Okay, so what are they? The specific requirements for addressing the legal framework to achieve compliance with CRPD. So it's about adopting legislative, administrative and other measures. So it's about law reform. And when you're talking about law reform within the development context, you're talking about capacity building. So what you're doing on a bilateral level to build capacity within a recipient country for them to undertake law reform. Should make sure your own house is in order to before you go printing to but you know that's a secondary issue at the moment. Um, modifying or abolishing existing laws, regulations, customs and practices that constitute discrimination. So again, it's about law reform, it's about education, <laughs> and it's about training. So again, it's about building capacity on a bilateral level within recipient countries, from donor countries, for them to engage in law reform, um, and also to embed it with within education, so that there is human rights education for so people. And also any training to embed and to um, build capacity within other, other arms, apart from just the governmental arms. Measures to eliminate discrimination on the basis of disability by any person, organisation or private enterprise. So again, law reform, regu regulatory reform, and education and training. So it's about having, again, bilateral engagement and building capacity for law reform to be able to build in anti-discrimination processes. 
and for those anti-discrimination processes to be promoted within the community so people understand their rights and how to use those anti-discrimination processes. Protect and promote disability rights in all program, in all policies and programs. So there is an, an overarching obligation to refrain from acts or practices that are inconsistent with CRPD. So they undertake to promote, or they have to undertake or promote research and development of universally designed goods, services, equipment and facilities. They have to undertake or promote research, development, availability and use of new technologies. So that is recognising that either the state undertake that themselves or they, they facilitate it or promote it through the private sector. So they should provide accessible information about mobility aids, devices and assistive technologies and promote training of professionals and staff working with persons with disabilities on CRPD rights. So when you're talking about training of professionals and staff working with persons with disabilities, you're basically talking about all professionals and all staff. Disability is disaggregated across the population spectrum. Whilst there is a concentration of people with disabilities within certain socio-economic strata, that does not mean that disability doesn't exist outside that strata. And so disability is something that affects all personal characteristics and across all domains. Can I have one more slide? Thank you. So, a state's party will be in violation of CRPD if it fails to take a step which is required by CRPD, so if it fails to enact more reform measures, so if it doesn't abolish discriminatory legislation, if it fails to remove properly obstacles which it is under a duty to remove to permit the immediate fulfil fulfilment of a right. So example, removing barriers that limit the participation of persons with disabilities in development planning. If it fails to implement without delay a right which is required by the CRPD to provide immediately. So ensuring non-discrimination in access to healthcare services for a child with a disability. And if it applies a limitation to a right recognised in the CRPD other than in accordance with CRPD. So <coughs> if a donor, country, a donor country provides funds to, um, and builds new schools that are not accessible to children with disability, that would be a violation of <coughs> CRPD obligations. And what's, one more for the road. The all important general obligation 43, and this is an incredibly important piece of feedback. Um, it's an incredibly important one, and it comes back to what I was speaking to you earlier about some of the really important new concepts that CRT, CRPD builds in. And this one is critical. It's about the engagement of people with disabilities in law reform and development processes. So Article 4.3, in the development and implementation of legislation and policies to implement CRPD in, and in other decision-making processes, states parties shall closely consult with and actively involve persons with disabilities, including children with disabilities through their representative organisations. So this relationship back to the other articles in CRPD means that 
you're engaging with people with disability on the implementation across the CRPD article spectrum. So how does this relate to development? Well, A, there should be engagement with people with disability within the donor country in terms of its development and its policies and implementation. But also that there should be engagement with recipient countries, um, people with disability, to ensure that they are engaged with how the implementation of the project in the identification of issues um, that the project is addressing. Um, colleagues from the Department of Foreign, Faith, Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia will be speaking to you um, later on in the week and I'm sure that they'll in identify how this has worked within the Australian um, Inclusion for Disability Development for All um, there in Australia's Inclusive Development Strategy. How do, um, and how do development policy of donors reflect this principle or not? Well, it's to what level they bring in the engagement of people with disability. To what extent are development projects informed by people with disabilities? So the people with lived experience of disability being central to identifying what the issues are in their local community for the diverse range of abilities within that community and how that is addressed through the various development projects. I have um, indulged you in terms of, ooh, in terms of time, we're way too long, and uh, since Jared's at my place in Australia, hopefully not hanging around in my office too comfortably, um, I will recognise your right for food. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary, for giving us the job. I know, I know I'm smiling with you wafting in from outside, so I think it may be time that we go for lunch and we will meet you back after lunchtime, roughly around two. Okay?